In professional sports, a franchise player is an athlete who is not simply the best player on their team, but one that the team can build their franchise around for the foreseeable future. Welcome into a brand new edition of Franchise Players here on Tobacco Road Sports Radio, TobaccoRoadSportsRadio.com. You can hear it every Friday on Terrestrial Radio in the triad, WWBG, 1470 AM, 5 PM, part of the TGI Friday lineup there. Uh, sports talk from 3 until 6 PM every Friday afternoon. And if you missed it there, you can hear it on WTOB in Winston-Salem at 6 PM on Fridays, 980 AM, 96.7 FM. A loaded show today. Um, Sam Farber from the Hornets Radio Network will come in. We'll talk about the Hornets. Look around the NBA, uh, his picks for who might be able to get out of the West and who might be able to get out of the East. And from uh, everything college basketball, Josh Burton is going to join us to talk about Friday slate in the Sweet 16, headlined by, of course, well, here, headlined by Duke and NC State's games. Uh, joining me here in segment number one, though, uh, two Panther content creators. So they've been going through the same type of pain that uh, myself and others have been going through for years <laughs> now wdr wrl's dennis cox and og triangle media's lauren brownlow in the house what's going on y'all how y'all doing can't complain well i think i think lb has been the sad panthers fan for a long long time so i think she's been bearing that pain a lot longer than i have <laughs> well hopefully happy days are around the the corner um i'm not used to the panther front office actually making uh, moves that seem to make sense uh, in the off season, and they've kind of been on a bit of a roll um, this this past couple of days. The biggest news that came down uh, actually from Tuesday, or was, well, actually Wednesday, uh, edge rusher Jadavion Clowney made his decision, decide to sign with the Carolina Panthers as a two year deal, twenty four million dollars. How big of a signing is it for the Panthers? Um, Lauren, I'll let you go first. I mean, I, I think it's important, you know, you lose Brian Burns, you're going to need to shore up your pass rush. You needed to shore up the pass, pass rush a bit, even with Brian Burns still there. So, and, you know, he had more sacks last year, Clowney did, than anyone on the Panthers roster. So that that's all also a good sign, I think. He's obviously close to home, um, you know, and they the Panthers don't always, in fact, I don't think super often sign guys for that reason. You know, like they don't sign guys from the area just because of that, just to try to get at people's heartstrings, so to speak. I think they did this because it makes, you know, some sense for them. It's not like a huge, huge investment. And you take a chance that he's still got something left in the tank. It seems like he still does. It, it, it makes sense to me. I, I like the signing. Dennis, what were your thoughts when you heard that uh, Clowney was signing? So I think Clowney and DJ Wanham, obviously, I think as a whole is a better upgrade than what the Panthers had yeah. as a whole last season. Let's, let's be honest because you actually have two capable guys, but my one concern with both these guys, DJ Wanham's coming off that quad injury that he's not going to be available for OTA. So you don't know what he's going to be going into the season, but I think these guys have been best in their careers when they've been opposite or around other guys who are elite edge edge rushers. Like Daniel Hunter was the top edge rusher with the Minnesota Vikings. DJ Wanham was opposite of that, got eight sacks. And we all know what Baltimore Ravens defense was. You know, Matabuke, we saw the guys like Patrick Queen in, on the inside, Kyle Hamilton at safety. He was part of a great defense as a whole, and for the second time in his career, got to nine and a half sacks. So to me, I feel like they got two really good, like, complimentary edge rush guys, as opposed to, like, if, if these guys were opposite of Brian Burns, it'd be like, let's go. But we don't have that situation. So I'm wondering how a two-year deal for a clowny fits into the long-term plans for Carolina. Again, as a whole, Wanham and, and Clowney elevate or at least are, are, are above what we saw last year as a whole from the Panthers in terms of edge rushers. At least you have two competent guys now. But again, I don't know what the long-term plan is for, for, for Clowney and, what he, and how he fits into Carolina because is Carolina in a rebuild? Because signing Clowney to a two-year deal feels like we can win right now. Yeah, and it's, you listen to Dave Canales at the uh, the league uh, annual meetings. It sounds like he's thinking they can compete right now. Uh, the way he was kind of talking to the press, so we'll, you know, we're all kind of tentative with the whoa, slow down a second, buddy. We <laughs> we've gone down this road before, but with Jadavion Clowney, with that signing, it brings some veteran leadership. I guess you could say he's thirty one. Uh, he's been in the league for I think eleven years, if I'm not mistaken. Um, former number one overall pick to the Houston Texans. He's never had double digit sack 
uh, uh, seasons before. Um, I think nine and a half is the most he's ever had in a season, but yeah. uh, he's a great run stopper as well. I've seen some of the other guys they brought in, like uh, like Ashawn Robinson, or whatever. They rank really high, uh, and of course, we already have Derek Brown here, who's ranked very high and stopping the run. So uh, maybe that's the idea with it. I didn't realize I knew he was from Rock Hill, and and played uh, high school ball in Rock Hill along with Stephon Gilmore, apparently, who they're also after to maybe bring back, which would bring another veteran back uh, into the fold. I didn't realize how much he was involved community wise in Rock Hill and how much of his family was here in Rock Hill and the surrounding areas. And uh, he had mentioned one of the factors coming to sign in Carolina because he was talking to the Jets. He was still talking to the Ravens um, was that his grandfather think, passed last year and he's got other family members that are in declining health or whatnot. And they're already here in the off season. All their community stuff's here. Their church is here. So it just felt like a natural fit uh, for him to come back home and play. Um, and it's kind of what led him here. And, Pretty team friendly deal, about ten million per. Uh, amongst like three players, I guess that they between Jewel, between uh, Clowney, and I think it was another player. I think it was Robinson. They have spent like thirty million between the three players, which is basically what Brian Burns was asking for <laughs> for himself. So they've kind of spread that money around to three capable potential starters. I would say uh, on uh, Israel Ebro's defense here. Um, we talked about it off uh, camera before we started. Give me your thoughts now that we're a couple of months into the Dave Canales regime, because th- my man is just like the same every time. Like he's literally up here. He lives life up here. He's one of those guys. I said it when they hired him. To me, he struck me as a guy that lives life without an alarm clock. Like he just doesn't need an alarm clock to get up. He can't wait to get into his day. His body just wakes him up and he, he goes and does what he's got to do. Give me your thoughts on Dave Canales and this upbeat personality. Is it something where we've become so pessimistic about the Panthers that it might kind of turn you off to the Panthers eventually, that he's so upbeat about it? Or is it refreshing to see someone that lives life this way actually controlling the football team and making decisions? Lauren? I mean, I'm not – I'm well, I am very <laughs> jaded, so I shouldn't say I'm not jaded. It's okay. We're all jaded. I'm a very yeah. jaded and cynical <laughs> person in general. But, you know, <laughs> you know, when you were t- saying that, it reminded me a little bit of the way I felt about somebody. I'm not comparing the two in terms of coaching, by the way, necessarily, or even their genuineness, because I don't know that yet. But like Dan Campbell, when I first saw Dan Campbell, I was like, is this dude for real right now? Like, I, I very much had the same, a similar vibe with him. I'm like, this dude has to be putting on like an act. He can't really be like this. This is a like a gimmick. This is too much. And then, you know, come to get to know Dan Campbell over the years. And sure enough, that's exactly <laughs> who the hell Dan Campbell is. And and I think, you know, so I'm I'm willing to sort of extend some, you know, grace in that department. But am I the type of person that gets up out of bed without an alarm clock? Absolutely not. But, uh, you know, and I guess he's still a youngish guy, especially for that profession. Um, He apparently sought out Andy Reid to sit right next to in the uh, coach's picture, which I actually thought for for a second, I thought Andy maybe sat next to him. But no, he sat next to Andy. I didn't know what to make of that. I was like, wow, that's an interesting pairing. (laughs) Maybe I'll just absorb like it, something from Andy. From honestly, somebody. the energy is not the worst. I mean, especially like, I don't know, Frank Reich certainly never gave you any like positive energy. And Matt Rule rang pretty false from day one, honestly, like in sort of the corporate speak BS that he was handing yeah, everyone. So like, I don't, so far with Dave Canales, like, is that my vibe? Not necessarily, but like, could that be genuine? Sure. And, and a lot of his players seem to buy into it, so... That, that seems to be the thing, too, because they had Adam Thielen on uh, Good Morning Football uh, Thursday morning, and he was kind of echoing the same type of thing that, you know, when you meet him, it, it's like infectious almost, like being around him and just like talking to him. And it's like you want to go do stuff for him. Uh, Dennis, what are your thoughts on this? Because we're, I guess, a couple of months into the hiring of, of Dave at this point. Um, we've seen enough sound bites and interviews and things of that sort to kind of gather the type of man that he is, I, I guess, from afar. What, what are your thoughts so far? Yeah, I'm surprised, Lauren, at the end of the day that you're not a big fan of that rule and all this coach speak stuff. I, I, I've been very, very shocked by that. But, you know, at the end of the day, Dave Canales is the lead coach. Uh, but I had to drop that in there for you. Uh, yeah. Lauren. Um, <laughs> honestly, here's the thing with him. If that's who he is and if he's authentic, that's the most important thing because players and people will sniff out fake. That's they right. sniffed it out with Matt Rule. We all did. And guess what? And, and and Lauren made a great point. There's zero amount of positive energy ever coming from, from Frank Reich. But if you are authentic and you're true to yourself and you are consistent with that, guys will believe you because you're being real to yourself and you're being real to them. That's the only thing that really matters. If he's super upbeat and energetic, fine. If that's who you are, be it. 
yeah, Frank Wright kind of put off like granddad like vibes, kind of yeah. like we're just gonna okay, grandpa, it's okay, it's all right. Like it was yeah. kind of like one of those kind of things with. Uh, it was like it was a pain in it was like a pain in the butt for him to like coach a football game. Like sorry, yeah, like it seemed yeah. like he was being irritated by having to do yeah. his job. It was it was weird, but from what we know, maybe he was irritated from what was going on behind the scenes. Um, at, uh, w <laughs> <laughs> got WRLs, Dennis Cox, and OG Triangle Media's Lauren Brown in the house talking little Panthers, little NFL stuff too. I want you guys to imagine if you were Dan Morgan and it's draft night, day two. You've got two second round picks now, and I've tried to look at the positive side of it. It's number 33 and number 39. You've got two of the top 40 picks in this draft. Uh, you went from that having no number one pick to having two of the top 40. So you kind of rectified it to a certain extent, not having a first round pick. What are you doing with those picks? Are you taking BPA like for both of them? Are you? Trading one, getting picks? Are you? What are you doing here? Like, are you trying to go up into the first rounds or somebody you really, really like? Uh, what are you doing with these two second round picks here, Lauren? I, I don't think they. I don't think they move up. I don't think they move up because Dan Morgan earlier this week even said you got to build this roster through the draft and you don't have a second round pick in twenty twenty five. You need as many picks as possible. If you keep one, that's fine, but you need to keep at least one. And I would not be shocked if it's pick thirty three that gets moved. I, they definitely need upgrades at wide receiver, and you could probably find a really good one either at 33 or at 39. The question is, is the body type built for what exactly you want? Because at 33, according to everyone in this draft, there's a ton of wide receivers that are really, really good. Who's going to be available? Is it like the 5'9 slot guy? Is it like the 6'3 jump ball guy? What do you want? You have to figure out, all right, well, if I could trade 33, I can still get that guy at 39. Maybe I can get an extra third-round pick and so on and so forth. To me, Keep one, trade the other, get as many guys as you can as possible through the draft. If you want to build through the draft, you got to get picks. Simple as that. Lauren, your thoughts on those two second round picks? What, are you, what would you do for Dan Morgan? Yeah, I mean, I'm for. I like. I like having more picks as well. The more picks, the better. It made me feel a lot better that this staff was able to get, you know, something out of Brian Burns, for instance, as opposed to maybe having had to franchise him and then him walk for nothing. And so, you know, and we saw McCaffrey. By the time they got rid of him, they got next to nothing, and they didn't get a, as much for Burns as maybe they could have. But they still got something that, like a, they still got value out of it at least at the end of the day, instead of letting nothing come back in return. So I was okay with it, but. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. Like 33 certainly has a lot of value, um, that pick, because it's obviously like, yeah, it's right there. And I love that they have two top 40 picks. If they kept them both, I wouldn't necessarily hate it either if they have players that they really want and if they can address multiple needs for sure. Like if they can get – if there's – some tackle that they really like or a defensive back or somebody like that, that that's right there that they want to take, like all by all means, like go for it. But at, or I mean, Hey, even, I don't know. I wouldn't even care that much if they took two wide receivers, if they did different things, like you mentioned, like I wouldn't, they certainly need all the receivers they can get. So yeah. like, I wouldn't necessarily hate that either. I think you just have to, and it's hard. This is why the draft is hard, I guess, but you really have to balance like getting the best possible player you can get at that spot with trying to address needs, but not having to be too married to needs. Like if a guy slips to you at that spot and, and you really like him and want him, then you should, you should pounce on it. You know, it's funny too. I'm so glad they switched the the, the calendar where free agency comes before the draft because now, because normally it would be like, okay, you go into the draft and you're trying to fill the needs in the draft and then free agency comes and it's like, okay, now I'm just filling in holes from what I think might happen from off of what I drafted. Now it's okay. I feel better going into the draft because I feel like they address so much stuff in free agency that now they really can sit there and do best player available each pick as it comes along. Like, can we do something to better the team here? Or do we need to trade it away? I'm with both of you. I would keep one of them and trade the other one um, maybe later into the second, maybe pick up a couple of thirds, something like that. Because the main problem with this team last year, and Skylar Callahan brought this up all last year, and me and John Stewart didn't want to hear it until we were like one and 12 or whatever ended up being at the point depth the depth on this roster was non-existent like That's once you it. got past the starter there was just it was some dude from off the street or or yeah. whatever and you know granted the defense played well with those dudes off the street but you can't expect that every year and when i say well they played well in terms of large yards allowed but that doesn't translate to me into top five defense because you're still letting them score with reckless abandon so it's like that's a tricky road to walk down when people are like oh you're breaking up the number five defense in the league or whatever it is 
Yeah, but <laughs> they're <laughs> bottom five in the NFL in terms of red zone touchdown percentage, in terms yeah. of sack percentage, and things uh, like that. They're they're bottom in the league in a lot of different categories. Yeah, it's a very deceiving stat with the yards allowed. Because I mean, if you're sacking Bryce Young on his own twenty and he fumbles the ball, <laughs> but, I mean, the other team only has, <laughs> you know, I mean, they only have yeah. twenty yards to go. So I mean, that's a win for the defense, I guess. Uh, quick thoughts on the NFL as a whole with the, uh, the owners' meetings this week. The NFL changing the kickoff rule. I'm not going to go through all the. Uh, what it is, uh, people can look it up at this point because it's a lot. But basically, it's the FF, it's the XFL's kickoff rule. Basically, uh, the kicker's still at 35. The kick, the kickoff team is lining up at the 30. The, mm, I think it's the 35 of the opposing team or something like that. The return team's at the 30. You got a landing zone where you can put two returners in there. Nobody can move until the ball touches the ground, um, and then it's just like a five yard sprint uh, to each other. But we were looking at it on Believe in Panthers, and it's like, okay, can somebody be back with the kicker? And the answer is no. Like, the kicker's back there by himself. So if a guy, the return guy, jukes the first guy, there's no one back there but the kicker. Like, and he's way back at the 35. So I thought I saw a stat in the XFL, like 90% of kickoffs were returned or something like that. Like, something nuts. Like, do you expect that to happen in the NFL? I don't think it'll be that high, but I think that's partially why they did this is they want more returns basically, yeah. but they want to still act like the player, you know, I'm, I should, I guess maybe I shouldn't say act like, but I can, Oops. it's fine. They've done <laughs> enough with player safety by now that I feel like I can say that they want to act like it's still like a player safety thing. When in reality, like, I think they're just tired of that play being boring and they want to add something to it and kind of incentivize teams to actually attempt to return. That's all I think that this is. It's like, I don't know. <laughs> I, think, I think it was only 22% of kickoffs last year were actually returned. I, yeah, I and that, 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 that feels pass. right. I mean, it, it actually yeah. almost feels high. I feel like they were almost never, you almost never saw it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of those returns were like squib kicks, yeah. <laughs> you know, basically. Uh -huh. you factor into that. And, but here's something as well is that they're, in, they're incentivizing returns, but also they're making sure that kickers don't kick the ball out of the back of the end zone because now the touchback goes all the way to the 35 yard line. Like you can actually, really hurt your team in that regard by actually kicking it out of the back of the end zone for a yeah. touchback. So again, you're incentivizing returns. They're trying to make the play. So it's not a bathroom break anymore. I think is what they're going to do. But I think as well is that with returns and where guys are lined up, teams are going to have better field positioning to start, to start drafts as opposed to the 25. I think you're going to start teams have more better starting a field positioning 30, 35 yard line. And there is a, the element of the player safety. You're not running 40 yards and smashing right. into somebody. It's, it's basically like an offensive lineman blocking a linebacker. You know, that five yards. Head start. Yeah, yeah. It's all it is. It, it's really all it is. So, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I'm excited for it. I'm kind of excited for it because, again, it's more than just a bathroom break like what it used to be. I mean, I'm curious to see how it works. I think it's just a one-year type deal. They're going to try this year, and if it, they can tweak it after this season if they want or always go back to the regular. Yeah, but – um, I did notice, I don't think it's a coincidence that the Panthers re-signed Sam Franklin right after this yeah. news dropped. Um, our special teams ace, I guess you could say, from last year, um, who can definitely be used in this formation. Uh, no more onside kicks unless you announce them, uh, which is the only part I really didn't like about this. That That's so, I, that did, I hate. You know? I hate yeah, the, that. the, That's the so whole, uh, A lot of times it's a surprise on purpose. Like, that's part of the strategy of it. The Sean Payton Super, Super Bowl onside kick. That can never happen again. Like, never. Mm -hmm. Unless they go back to the original rules. And, uh Skyler brought up a good point. What if it's squib kicked? Like if someone squib kicks it, like may say by accident and it hits one of those players first, what happens then? I'm reading the rule and it seems like, well, the play's still dead until it hits the ground in the landing zone or one of the receivers. So if say somebody squib kicks it and it goes through that first line or whatever, say it bounces off somebody's leg, that ball is still technically live. They just can't move. So I, I, don't, mm, <laughs> I don't know. It's going to make it where – we're going to have more Pat McAfee type kickers, I think, entering the league that are like all jacked up because that's like your last line of defense is the kicker. Like you're going to have $30 million kickers out here, like <laughs> playing like multiple roles, or you're going to have to convert a defender to, to kick. So you can hey, actually. Justin Reed. <laughs> Justin Reed can kick. <laughs> and then uh, finally, banning the hit drop tackle this week. Uh, Jonathan Stewart had some uh, cho choice words about, about he's not very happy about it. And he's an offensive player. Um, thoughts on this because. I, between that and the on um, well the kicks the kickoff stuff i feel really bad for nfl defensive players this week like it feels like the nfl was like you know what we'd almost be better if we didn't have the defense out there and we just let them <laughs> play against dummies or tackling dummies or whatever and see who could score the most in an hour thoughts on the hip drop well it's a swivel hip drop tackle basically when 
you drop down and you use the weight of your body and twist to bring the the, the ball carrier down, which I don't know much all, but I grew up, that was called a tackle. Um, yeah. Yes. <laughs> like, I don't know yes, what we're is. supposed to do here. Like what is it? Is, are they going too far? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Not that that's about them before, <laughs> but I mean, and like, honestly, I'm, I think I'm more surprised too, because like the pushback continues to grow for the terrible way that roughing the quarterback is continuously applied like oh it, it it's always awful almost like there's always there's at least one terrible one a week where you just go what like what do you want him to do like how exactly do you want him to tackle the quarter and now to add these kinds of like rules that I don't think really I don't know that they really do a whole lot and this is like how guys are taught to tackle they're not going for anybody's head or anything like that they're yeah. not bringing a guy down with the horse collar I, I understand yeah. why those are You're but I don't know legs. what yeah, I just don't, I don't, for me, this just feels like doing way too much and you're already adding on rules that make it just that much more difficult to get a stop. And I, I don't think some of us want, like, I don't think we necessarily want to see that. Like, that's not how you solve your points problem. If you think you have a points problem is by like basically outlawing tackling. Like that's not going <laughs> to, you're not allowed not to help these ways. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, you can tackle from like here down. Right. Like, the abdomen don't land with your body weight on him <laughs> yeah don't land with your body weight because then it's still bad uh like dennis i'll let you have the last word on this the, uh, the swivel hip toss tackle thing whatever it's you can't do it yeah <laughs> I, I, I played linebacker when i got to college um and that's just called tackling yeah you know that's simple as that especially if i'm chasing the guy from the side or from behind it just makes it even more difficult to do now, if you're tackling someone straight on, that's different, but you're not always going to be in that situation. I don't like it, and I'm, I I commend even offensive players being like, this is stupid. Uh, I, I, I do not envy defensive players in the NFL right now because, okay, if you're going to give the offense this protection, we we did see the NFL institute, like the running back lowering their head, yes. ball carrier lowering their head like a certain yeah. – never yeah. once saw that called, ever. Never once saw that called. I'm like, so you're going to have this rule for player safety again, but also as well, you're adding another subjective thing for officials to call. I'm like, yeah, that's this was already have enough on their plate. Oh, here's just one more thing piling on. It's it's stupid. It's I stupid. Almost feel like they're going to treat it like holding because holding you can call holding on every play, really. If you really wanted to, if you just wanted to be a, you know an ass, then you could just call holding every yeah. single play because it's there. But they they're really it, it has to be blatant almost for you to get it called. And even then, sometimes it's not called. With this, I think the refs are going to take it back and be like, all right, we've been watching this game for years, too. Like, was that tackle? It, it's a dumb rule. <laughs> it's a dumb rule. I can't really justify it any other way because that's how you're taught to tackle. And especially now with all the rules against hitting up here, going for the knees, uh, all that kind of stuff. Where are you supposed to tackle them? And, like, it's going to get to a point where it's almost like uh, like flag football. Or you're going to have to ask for consent to tackle the offensive player <laughs> <laughs> because it's like you can't touch them anyplace else. You can't grab them by the legs. Real, well, you can't go at the knees. You can't go at their head. You can't really you can't really do anything but just kind of go straight at them like like this, <laughs> like, like you're trying to hug them. And I don't know if that's going to I don't know if that's going to make sense going forward um, and, and just going forward, especially for the ones that have been taught to tackle this way for their entire life. Now you're asking them to switch all of a sudden and think about it in like a millisecond before contact. Like, it's just, yeah. how do you do that? Like, it was already bad before, before the thing is too, like a lot of plays, if you slow-mo it, it's always going to look worse than it, than it does in real time. When you speed up a play and you like, we, we show, I think too many slow-mo replays in my, opinion. I wish they showed more real time yeah. replays because that's what the ref saw in real time you know yeah, like true. yes when they're in the booth of course we should see the slow-mo but i also get frustrated because we relitigate a lot like what they were able to see when they made the call and sometimes calls get a lot worse when you see it in real time sometimes they get better but like some you know i think that that should be taken into account as well like it's really hard to do that and you you did hear too that they're gonna like buzz down apparently they're gonna let the replay official upstairs have more of a say i don't know if you heard that like in penalties and stuff so that should be interesting. <laughs> Let's have a four and a half hour football game. Let's do that. <laughs> Cause that's what, where it's going to be going, I guess. Um, now I know uh, as I get you guys out of here, uh, Dennis, you and Chris Lee do Panthers playbook mm -hmm. uh, for WRL. You can follow them there on the WRL uh, YouTube channel. Lauren, you and Dimitri uh, uh, Ravenos, you guys were doing what's called the young guns podcast. If I'm not mistaken. Right. But then you changed yeah. the name. So the new name is uh, 
what did you say it was again? <laughs> this team, uh, is this team is killing us. This team yeah. is killing us. <laughs> about the Carolina Panthers. Yeah, just we felt like that's timeless. Yeah, it, yeah. it fits. It fits, and that's over on the OG Triangle Media's YouTube channel. You can follow find their work there. Uh, go support Panther content creators because we're doing this under an extreme level of stress and love <laughs> for the Carolina Panthers. So <laughs> pray for us, please. Like we're, we we got to get through this off season, get to the draft, and see what happens and go from there. But it, so far, so good. I think with the new regime, um, it's weird to have a sense of normalcy, like with the the, the program and not having uh, questions about the owner and uh just everything <laughs> in general like i feel like i can sit back a little bit just like let's let them cook a little bit see what they do so uh appreciate you guys coming through and uh we'll check back with you guys as we get closer to the draft um coming up next hornet radio network sam farber's going to come check in give us a, a outlook for the charlotte hornets uh, i think 10 games left in the season word just broke earlier this morning that they're shutting Lamelo ball down for the rest of the season uh, probably a good thing because I think he's only played 22 games this season uh, to begin with. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that and the NBA playoff race. Who do you trust coming out of the East and in the West in the play-in uh, tournament as it stands right now? Back in just a bit here on Franchise Players. Franchise players are often referred to as the face of the franchise. Welcome back into Franchise Players here on TobaccoRoadSportsRadio.com. Rate and subscribe to the YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash at Tobacco Road Sports Radio. Shout out to WRIL's Dennis Cox and OG Triangle Media's Lauren Brownlow, who stopped by to talk a little Carolina Panthers and NFL rule change uh, convo there from just a bit. And coming up in just a bit, we'll have uh, uh, even more talk. Sweet 16, we'll pick out the Friday uh, games. On the line with us right now, Hornets Radio Network, Sam Farber in the house. The Hornets uh finally home after a insanely long road trip uh sam finally back in the queen city and uh the hornets got about about 10 games left in the season i think there's about seven of those eight of those that are at home uh so they're they're settling in for the stretch here what's up sam how you doing i'm doing great desmond yeah it's great to be home it, it was a long stretch there on the road 13 out of 17 uh felt like we were just always traveling so good to be back good to be at the hive hornets definitely responded to it with a win uh last night against cleveland so let's actually get into that. So starting off, I woke up this morning to the news that the Hornets officially have shut down point guard LaMelo Ball for the uh, the season. Ball's only appeared in only 58 total games the past two years and only 22 this year. Thoughts on Ball being shut down this season and uh, outlook going forward? Because I've already got friends hitting me like, oh, we should trade him, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I'm glad you weren't running the Warriors during Steph's first couple of years in the NBA because <laughs> he literally had ankle injuries like this, too. They figured a way to get around it and get it going. He already got his extension. So thoughts on LaMelo. Uh, and I'm sure this was a very frustrating season for him. Certainly. I mean, look, injuries are part of sports. And so it, it kind of comes with the territory. It's unfortunate. Uh, you know, the, the the Patriots didn't get rid of Tom Brady because he tore his knee up one year. Uh, Warriors with Steph Curry. And and so, you know, you, you hope for the upside of the ability, which LaMelo most definitely has. And, uh, and you root for health. And so, you know, look, even in a truncated season due to injury, LaMelo's numbers skyrocketed once again. So he, he continues to build on the all-star campaign from two years ago. And even though it's unfortunate he hasn't been able to play in more games, uh, you know, you more than keep your fingers crossed, you trust that he'll have a healthy offseason, which he can build on his body and be ready to go come next October. So the Hornets have 10 games to go here in the regular season. They've been officially eliminated from the playoffs. Um, you mentioned Brandon Miller at the top of the uh, segment, dropped 31 points on the Cavaliers on Wednesday. And it kind of feels like the Hornets have taken this role of let's just mess up the playoff bracket. Like let's let's go, let's do whatever we can to mess it up. Cause even that loss dropped Cleveland from three to four in the Eastern conference standings, which puts them in a different type of uh, playoff uh, situation altogether. Give me your thoughts on Brandon Miller's season rookie year, uh, all the way back when the debate was Brandon Miller or Scoot Henderson, um, and I was I was in the Scoot camp, and I'm glad to admit I was wrong. Brandon Miller has been way more than advertised, in my opinion, for for that pick. Give me your thoughts watching him up close for 70 you know games now or whatever. How how legit is Brandon Miller, and is he a guy that they can build around going forward? He most definitely is. He's legit. He's the real deal. And, and even the game the other day against Cleveland, we saw another uh, uh, evolution of Brandon Miller because he went from being a really, really good player on the floor to being the star, being the focal point. Uh, Hornets took on a Cavs team that's top four in the East, has multiple all-stars on that roster. It was crystal clear over back-to-back -back games, Brandon Miller was the best player on the floor as a rookie. So 
that's the platform he's building from. Uh, it is not a requirement to have this kind of rookie season to be an all-star in the NBA. But if you're going to be a superstar, it, it is kind of a prerequisite. Most of them do hit these kind of high marks in their opening season. And Brandon Miller most definitely is. Uh, the 31 points, not just how many he scored, but how he scored them, how the game was going, uh, and how he turned things in the Hornets' favor. It was really a spectacular effort and something to build on. Follow him on Twitter slash X, whatever the kids are calling it these days, at Sam Farber Live. Sam Farber from the Hornets Radio Network here with us on Franchise Players. And I wanted to, before we move off from um, from the Hornets, because I was going to ask you who the Hornets MVP is this year. So I'll give you a it's couple Brandon. Of it's Brandon. It's Brandon. Okay, so that's what it is. <laughs> Brandon Miller is the Hornets MVP. Looks great. Uh, very efficient shooter. Good three-point shooter. I think right now Hornets fans are salivating over the idea of LaMelo Ball and and Brandon Miller in the same backcourt together, growing together going forward, and whatever is going to happen with Mark Williams, because I don't think Mark Williams has played since December, has he? He is not, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. I mean that that's the that's the blueprint that you hope for with the Charlotte Hornets. I mean, you're you're looking for stars and superstars and all stars, and uh, the Hornets, in theory, have two of them on their roster right now: a borderline one in Miles Bridges and a really really strong center in Mark Williams. The difficulty has been that over the last couple of seasons, there, there hasn't been any consistent play for them all together. They've played a grand total of, I think, 15 minutes together. Wow. So that's not enough. Uh, you you got to get all the pieces aligned to figure out just how good they can be, where the ceiling is for the group. And then until you know that, I think it's hard to make really strong arguments for or against the group being uh, able to reach the, the ceiling we're hoping for. But I, I think, you know, in theory, that ceiling's very high. It's weird, too, because I'm old school. I'm 46. So I look at the NBA standings right now, and it used to be the younger teams didn't elevate as quickly as some of these younger teams have elevated to the top of the standings. And I think when I look at the Hornets roster, I look at potential like going forward, and I compare it to what I'm seeing in Minnesota, what I'm seeing in Oklahoma City, uh, even like the Knicks, uh, the Kings, there, there's the Pelicans. There's a lot of really young teams that have really stepped up. The defending champion Nuggets are fairly young. Uh, I know Jokic plays like a 45-year-old, but he, he's a fairly young guy. Um, quickly around the league, staying in the Eastern Conference, as it stands today, through late March, uh, the 76ers, well, the Heat, the 76ers, the Bulls, and the Hawks are all in the Eastern Conference playing spots uh, 7 through 10. After you've, you've seen all four of those teams up close and personal all season long, in your opinion, which one of those four teams is the most dangerous to come out of the play-in round in the East? I think it's most definitely Miami. You know, they've done this before, made a run from yeah. the play-in tournament all the way into the NBA Finals. Uh, they're better this year, I would say, than they were last year. They're a deeper group uh, in terms of star power, maybe not as deep in terms of 1 through 10 on the roster, but frankly, you're not using 1 through 10 when you get to the postseason. Uh, last year, they did not have all of their guys, all their big-name guys uh, ready for the postseason. This time around, hopefully they do, because I think it's a really – good team and i think it speaks well of what the nba has done here with the play-in tournament that you've got such high quality squads there i mean look at the west uh, you, you're gonna have a team with an above 500 record right now looking in at the play-in tournament we thought the hornets had it bad going 43 and 39 and getting a 10th seed uh, that might be good for 11th in the west this year so uh, i i think the depth of the nba's talent pool uh, really has been boosted here but it, it all comes down to health i, I have very little doubt in my mind that the Hornets would be at the very least in the mix, if not in the group, had they been healthy. But they weren't. Uh, so they'll get the benefit of the draft pick. They'll get the benefit of uh, hopefully a healthy summer for those guys who were injured the majority of the season and hit the ground running come October. Um, but health is the name of the game. It, it's not so much that Oklahoma City and Sacramento and Orlando are so much farther along than Charlotte. I, I think they are. I'm not suggesting that the Hornets are, are ready to be the number two seed in either conference. Um, but the biggest difference between the two teams is not the level of talent it's the level of availability that, yeah that's exactly right because again mark williams hasn't played since december lamello's only played 22 games brandon miller has been pretty durable uh he's missed a couple games here and there throughout the year but nothing to that length um and miles bridges so i guess that's your core four uh for charlotte going forward um and we just need to get him out on the floor to see what we have uh and kind of go that's it yeah, yeah. So. 15 minutes together and yeah it's, so it's you can't weird. judge it off that it's weird. It's weird to have these like top 10 draft picks and they haven't played together like over the past three years. So we'll, we'll see what the Hornets can do, especially in the offseason to kind of turn it around. Looks like they're going to have a high draft pick. Kind of a weird draft. I, I haven't really got a good feel for who's coming out that's going to be a top three player that we might be able to be in the uh, 
the running for. And then uh, before I get you out of here, Sam, in the West, at the top of the standings, I talked about it. It's the defending champion, Denver Nuggets. But then you got the young Minnesota Timberwolves uh, with an ascending Anthony Edwards and the uh, a very young Minis- uh, excuse me, a very young uh, Oklahoma City Thunder with it feels like 10 more first round draft picks that they haven't used yet <laughs> in third place right there. Uh, and a shy Gilgis Alexander, who the Hornets actually drafted and traded off to Oklahoma City on draft night, if I'm not mistaken. Are you taking one of those three to make the NBA finals out of the West? Or the oh, rest yeah. of the field, or the rest of the field in the West. No, it, I would take one of those three. Uh, you know, in the East, uh, I mean, I think Boston is head and shoulders above everyone, and in the West, I think Denver is the defending champs. Uh, they've given us no signs that they are not the team that we saw in the finals last year. So I think they are the favorite, and, and maybe not the heavy favorite, just because of the depth of the West. Uh, but they clearly, you know, have that capability again. So I, I would pick them at the top. I'm curious about the bottom of the West because it's the Lakers and the Warriors. Um, you actually have the Suns in there too in the play-in. So you could potentially have Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, Steph Curry, LeBron, LeBron James, Anthony Davis all in the play-in in the West in these one-off games. Um, I, I'm a Laker fan, so I, it feels like they've been here the past couple of years. Um, and now that I'm seeing the standings, I'm seeing these young teams kind of elevating. I don't see Oklahoma City dropping anytime soon. I don't see Minnesota. If anything, I see Minnesota getting better. Uh, Anthony Edwards, to me, is starting to grow into potentially the face of the league. Um, and he was in the same draft as, as Lamelo, right? He was what the second. He was, yeah. he was the first pick. First Lamelo guy. was third. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, really, it, it comes down to health. I think the ability on these teams is self-evident. It's health. It's health and availability, and and that's the. You know, the frustrating part, I think, for Charlotte, but I think the league is getting better, stronger. I think the Hornets are in a group of teams that seem to have two, minimum two stars on the roster. It's about getting them on the floor. And you look at the games played for uh, the Hornets stars compared to other teams, and, and that's the reason for the difficulty. But it does give you the opportunity to grab a third. If you're picking top five, your, your job is to get an all-star. That's my opinion. At least. Yeah, I agree. And so yeah. I think for Charlotte, you get a third one, uh, watch out. Maybe we're looking at uh, the Hornets being the Thunder team that had Durant, Westbrook, and Harden at the same time. Maybe that's in store here for the Hornets. Let's see what they can do. New ownership. There, there's, there's a buzz in the air about what's potential in the future. Um, I don't know if I'll talk to you again before the end of the regular season, but this is the end of the second year of Tobacco Road's uh, extended production coverage of the Charlotte Hornets up here in the triad in North Carolina. Um, we have you guys on WWBG 1470 AM up here in Greensboro um, and surrounding counties. And um, we'll be again with you guys next year. I got to take uh, a trip down to Charlotte and use one of these suites because I get a, I get a chance to use a suite and I've yet to use one uh, <laughs> in the, in the Come two on plus yeah, I, know, I need to get down to there. reimagine Spectrum Center next year too so it's going to be uh, oh, it's going to be a sight to see we can't wait to have Ooh. you so uh, definitely that and uh, you can catch the rest of the Charlotte Hornet games home and away on WWBG 1470 AM here in the triad going forward you can listen to the magical voice of Sam Farber on the Hornets radio network uh, follow him on Twitter at Sam Farber live appreciate you doing this Sam and uh, hope you have a great rest of the weekend. Anytime, Desmond. Thanks for having me. Coming up, we'll talk a little Sweet 16 with Josh Burton from Everything College Basketball here on Tobacco Road Sports Radio. You're listening to Franchise Players. Franchise players are often referred to as the face of the franchise. Shout out to WRL's Dennis Cox and OG Triangle Media's Lauren Brownlow for stopping by to talk a little Carolina Panthers and NFL talk. Also, shout out to the Charlotte Hornets Radio Network, Sam Farber, for stopping by as the Hornets wind up to the end of their regular season to give us some news on the ball and thoughts on the rest of the NBA. Round and third base sliding into home uh, here in segment three. He's from Everything College Basketball Podcast. If you have not checked his podcast out yet, definitely do so. One of the best ones out there in terms of in-depth coverage. Uh, Josh Burton joining franchise players here on Tobacco Road Sports Radio. What's up, man? How you doing? Dev, it is good to be on. Uh, you sent me the the question if I'd be on with you. I was like, man, of course. Yeah, let's make the time work. And I'm doing good, man. Uh, Sweet 16 kicks off tonight. Another busy week in college basketball. It's crazy to think this time on Monday we'll know the final four. So it, it's went quick. Even crazier that, you know, by the time this weekend's over, we might have two clashes of uh, four ACC teams playing each other in the Elite Eight. It's uh I can't think of a time when that's happened before, but before we get into your sweet 16 picks, I wanted to pick your brain a little bit while I had uh, had you on here about the transfer portal. Like the, the portal 
I just keep seeing names. I just saw Wake Forest just lost Boopy Miller and somebody else to the portal today uh, on top of what they've already lost. Um, it feels weird that it's open right now. The season's still going on. Your thoughts on the transfer portal being open before the season even ends? Because as I, as I see here, um, it looks as if it's about 650 players in it right now um, once it opened up. I think it was last week when it opened up, and there's already 650 players in there. What are your thoughts on this transfer portal? It's it's nuts, and um, you would like to think that you could put trust in the NCAA, but they have decades worth of showing us that they they don't know how to manage properly. Like it took them forever to get on the board with NIL, and you hear the stories of like Chris Weber and Jalen Rose back to the Fab Five, we're producing all this money for the university and the NCAA, and then you go to the bookstores in Michigan, and people are they're selling their their jerseys. And they're not getting a cut of it, but yet if somebody pays ten dollars for pizza, they got in trouble. So you can't trust the NCAA. And there's a simple fix to this. Like the portal is is good in a lot of ways because it allows players the opportunity, like coaches have always had. It allows them opportunity. Like, all right, maybe this isn't the best fit. I can move on without the repercussions of the old school way of setting out a year, which is fine. But they've allowed it to be the wild wild west and to compound the issue. They've allowed it to open up during the middle of the NCAA tournament actually opened up the Monday last Monday before the start of the NCAA tournament, just the day after selection Sunday, which is crazy because you're overshadowing the best sporting event, not only in the NCAA calendar, but in my opinion, the best sporting event every single year. And it, there's a simple fix. Just push the portal, the beginning of the portal back three weeks. As soon as the national championship game ends on Monday evening, Tuesday, then the portal opens because there's no way that coaches that's in the NCAA tournament, game planning, scheming, getting their teams ready should also have to be trying to figure out who they're going to grab for the portal and do an evaluation. So the simple fix is just as soon as the season's over, the portal opens up instead of doing it right before the start of your biggest event all season. It makes no sense. Yeah. I don't, I don't understand because it messes up other things too. The, the, the all the teams that the client invitations to the NIT, I think a lot of that's because they didn't know what kind of roster they're going to have. Like the, they, they were able to leave literally as soon as the, the conference tournaments were pretty much over. So a lot of places like Wake Forest and Pitt and others that didn't make the tournament declined to go to the NIT. Well, Wake actually went, but Pitt declined. Well, St. Um, John's and, and yeah, yeah, yeah. St. John's and a lot of them. And it, it's gotten kind of like college football because if you watch college football, and, unless you're playing in either like the big Rose Bowl or the the college football playoff. You know, you, a lot of the top players who have like NFL draft aspirations are playing on transfer and they they skip the bowls. So the bowls have kind of become meaningless. And that's what college basketball is kind of turning into. The NIT used to be a really big deal at one point for maybe younger listeners. The NIT at one point was bigger than the NCAA tournament and kind of the early stages. It was a little bit more prestigious. It's an older tournament. And it's a good launching pad. Like you see Seton Hall in there right now in the final four, Georgia to the final four. Those kids stayed and played. That's a good tournament. But because of the portal opening up so early, players don't want to get in the portal as fast as they can. And coaches that maybe have an NIT team are like, well, we got to look at next year. There's no point of playing extra games if nobody's wanting to play. So it's a mess. Just push it back three weeks. That's all we're asking. Push it back till after national champions crowned. And then the wild, wild west kind of portal era can open up. And the portal along with NIL, um, has shifted college basketball back to the older teams being the ones that are still here uh, from this point onward, in my opinion. Um, you have some outliers like Duke. I think Duke's one of the youngest D1 teams uh, this entire season. But they've got some older players as well. But the majority of the ones, the higher seeds, typically are older teams. As we pull up the, uh, the brackets here um, for March Madness for the Sweet 16, and we'll get uh, Josh's picks here. Uh, since we're dropping this episode mid-afternoon on Thursday, we'll actually be able to hear his thoughts on Thursday night's games, um, and then we'll go a little bit more in-depth with Friday's uh, matchups here. Um, I'm a little nervous because my squad is playing at 939 um, mm -hmm. out west. Uh, we'll get to them in just a bit. But first, uh, tonight over in the west uh, on CBS, the six-seed Clemson taking on the two-seed Arizona and Caleb Love. Um, I have to admit I thought Clemson was overseeded when I first saw the bracket uh, as a six-seed. They've played pretty well. Um, I, I've always liked P.J. Hall. That game's at 7.09 p.m. It kicks off coverage tonight on CBS. Give me your thoughts on Clemson versus Arizona in the Western Regional Semifinal number one. 
Well, if you listen to us over at our tournament show over Everything College Basketball, every man to a T, including the guests we came on, had not only Clemson getting beat in the first round by New Mexico, but we had New Mexico making a deep run, and Clemson <laughs> just ran through the first week in an NCAA tournament. Like, that was the most impressive Clemson has looked since probably they went into Chapel Hill and beat North Carolina back in January. And it, it's weird because Clemson's always had kind of this weird potential, but they always just kind of played down to teams. And now all of a sudden we've got good Clemson through the first two games of the tournament. Arizona presents a whole unique challenge. Like, no offense to New Mexico, and um, I can't even remember off the top of my head who else they played right now, but Arizona with their depth, their size, when their guards play good, their guards are shaky at times, but when Kylan Boswell and Caleb Love and the, comp- or and the those guys play well, and then you throw in Omar Balo down low, Pella Larson as kind of that wing, versatile wing, plays 3-4 area. Like, they're a whole nother matchup. I think for Clemson, you're going to have to rely on the defense again. And you need guys like Joe Girard to hit some shots, make Arizona have to come out and guard, open the lane up. You need P.J. Hall and Chase Hunter to play extremely well, especially, I think, Chase Hunter and that matchup of kind of the five-man because if he can bring Omar Balo away from the rim and then really opens things up for Clemson, I like Arizona in this game. Like, I know Clemson, I just raved about them, how well they've been playing. But I like Arizona in this game. I think overall talent, they are a better team from top to bottom. And I do think Omar Balo does get Chase Hunter in foul trouble. And I think Caleb Love and Kylan Boswell has not been great, but I think he'll play good enough in this game. I like Arizona to advance and maybe comfortably. We'll save by like seven or eight points. I, I like Arizona and kind of the way they're built right now. Right now, as it stands right now, the line is Arizona by six and a half. So um, definitely that's CBS. Uh, It's the East, excuse me, it's the East and the West tonight. Uh, It's 7.39 p.m. on TBS, and it looks like you can see it on True TV also in Boston. It's the East uh, uh, Regional Semifinal, the five-seed San Diego State taking on the one-seed UConn. Both of these teams, Final Four teams from last year. Um, Thoughts on this one? Because I honestly went against the grain and picked UConn to not get this far just for that that wacky fact that the uh, last few uh, defending national champions hadn't made it back to the Sweet 16 the following year when they were a one seed. UConn pushed through that, and now they're in Sweet 16 territory taking on uh, the San Diego State team. Quick thoughts on that and your pick for uh, to move on. Well, I mean, it's a rematch of last year's national championship game, and – Uh, let's be honest, San Diego State's going to have to slow this game down, be physical, and it's going to be tough because UConn is also a very physical team. I just don't see San Diego State manufacturing enough points. And if you watch what UConn has done through the first two games, I mean, they're just putting whoopings on everybody. And I think they're a buzzsaw. Like Jaden Ladiz for San Diego State is going to have to have an incredible game to even make this close down the stretch. But I just think UConn, they know who they are. They have the best identity in college basketball. They've got a almost like the perfect build of a team because they got shooting, playmaking. They've got young freshmen that are stars. They've got a big man inside that's NBA talent wise. I think UConn rolls big in this one. I just, San Diego State's not going to create enough offense to keep up with this high powered UConn team, in my opinion. The line right now is UConn by 11 and a half. Uh, the game's seven thirty nine. Yeah, it's a big line. Uh, it's the biggest line out of the games tonight. Um, 7.39 p.m. UConn, the overall the overall number one seed in this tournament, still playing. Uh, 9.39 p.m., a game that's got my interest in a lot of people here in the area. Number one seed, North Carolina in the West, taking on the four seed, Alabama Crimson Tide. Alabama is the top scoring team in D1, averaging about 90 points per game. Carolina is one of the top teams in three-point defense uh, in the country. How, how do you see this game playing out? Fast, fast, fast. I mean, the <laughs> tempo in this one should be off the charts. Both teams want to get up and down. Both teams want to score a lot of points. But the thing is, is North Carolina, historically, they have been such an offensive-minded team. They've been Alabama as far as get up and go. That's kind of the Carolina identity, especially in fast break transition off of miss or miss shots. But Carolina knows how to play defense this year. They're, they're the number six ranked defense in, in terms of efficiency on Ken Palm. That has changed the course and the identity of this North Carolina team and made them why they are a one seed and why they have a chance to win a national championship. Alabama, on the other end, doesn't want to play a lick of defense, ranking 101, and it was worse even a few weeks ago. They were like 119. But offensive basketball, if you're into that and that's all you care about, 
this should produce fireworks. You got Mark Sears against RJ Davis, two all American guards going at each other. A lot of shot making, a lot of athleticism, up and down tempo. But I think at the end of the day, North Carolina will get enough stops. In basketball, we call them defensive kills. Defensive kills are three stops in a row consecutively. I think that's the difference in really in Alabama's loss. That's been the only difference. If you can shut them down for three possessions in a row and you have a high powered offense like Carolina does, you're able to gap them by like nine, 10 points and keep them at bay because they're having a hard time getting stopped. So I like Carolina to win this. I think this is going to be highly entertaining though. And the tempo should be off the charts. Crazy. It's crazy when I'm looking at this on the ESPN site, uh, it's talking about ticket prices uh, at TD Garden in Boston, where the uh, UConn, San Diego State, and the uh, Illinois, Iowa State games being played tonight. It says tickets as low as $203. You look at the <laughs> ones at Crypto.com Arena in LA, where it's Clemson, Arizona, Carolina, and Alabama. It says tickets as low as $37. So there's a drastic difference in price in the uh, East and Western uh, or West regions. Um, and then, real quick, give me a winner between number two, Iowa State, and number three, Illinois, and then we'll hop over to Friday. Yeah, so it's the number one offense in Illinois against the number one defense in Iowa State. To, to put that in context, we don't get that matchup in the NCAA tournament a lot. I think it's been at least over 10 years, if my uh, stats serve me correctly, since that's happened. So which one is your – it's going to be your pick of poison real quick. Illinois' offense versus Iowa State's defense. I favor Illinois. I think they're able to make runs. I don't trust Iowa State's offense if they fall behind like six, seven points to – a high-powered offense. I like Illinois. Terrence Shannon Jr. has been the best offensive guard, best offensive player, period, in this tournament. I think he has a monster night. I trust the offense over the defense. Illinois wins. That one's got the shortest line of the night. It's got uh, Iowa State by one and a half points, so pretty much a pick them um, in that matchup between the two-seed Iowa State and the three-seed Illinois in the East region. Friday, uh, another great night of basketball. Uh, the the really the only main surprise still standing in the uh, the tournament will kick things off 7 or 9 p.m. on CBS. 11th seed NC State taking on the two seed Marquette in the South region. Thoughts on NC State's march here through the tournament so far, and can they can they get another win? Well, they're trying to pull the UConn, right? They're trying to pull the Kimball Walker UConn, the only team to win five games in five days and win the conference tournament, and UConn with Kimball Walker back in 2011 won the national title. I mean, they're on a seven-game winning streak now. They came out of – they had a great win against Texas Tech in round one. They got a little lucky in playing Oakland in round two with open upset in Kentucky, but they did their job. Now they play a Marquette team that is going to challenge them offensively. Carolina State's going to have to stay home defensively, try to, their best to guard some of these actions that Marquette runs, try their best to slow down Tyler Kolick. But I like – I like momentum. Momentum in sports, I always say it, if you've ever played or coached in it, it is a real thing. And momentum is clearly on North Carolina State side. I mean, they've got the tournament darling in DJ Burns. Like, that dude gets cheered. Who doesn't, yeah, love, a, who doesn't love a big man that is light on his feet and does the things he does, right? I mean, and he's going to present real problems for Marquette's defense because they don't – they're big, but they're not physical, and I think he could go have a monster game. To me, it comes down to Carolina State's guards. Jaden Taylor, Casey Morsell, Michael O'Connell, DJ Horn, they've been playing phenomenal here in this last week and a half, two weeks. Can they keep it up? If they can score like they have been, they've got a real shot to knock Marquette off. I'm going Marquette, but I think if Carolina State's guards play well like they have been, I think you may see an upset in this one. The line right now on that is Marquette by six and a half. These lines on Friday are way uh, more closer together than what uh, we're seeing for Thursday where there's like double-digit uh lines out there i'm gonna um i'm gonna skip over to the nightcap in uh the south region the one seed houston taking on the four seed duke blue devils at 9 39 p.m the care the state game and the duke game as well as the clemson and the carolina games are all four on cbs so you can actually watch those free over over there antenna television if you have that there um <laughs> i believe you can get to it on paramount plus as well if it's on you cbs can, yeah. Yeah, so uh, thoughts on number one Houston taking on this Duke team. I think a lot of us had written Duke off after what we saw in the ACC tournament and the you know prior to that, and a lot of us had started labeling Duke a soft team. I don't know if that label's gone away just because they've won two games here in the tournament against two double-digit uh, seeds, but um, clearly they're looking at this as a restart. But Houston is a bunch of like 24-year-old grown men uh, playing basketball, and Duke's yeah. one of the youngest teams in the country. So give me your thoughts on this matchup. The one seed Houston, who's been floating around number one all year, to be honest, in the AP, uh, taking on this Duke squad. Well, I mean, we're going to find out real quick uh, going against Houston about Duke's toughness. And, yeah, I mean, they look good in the first weekend. 
to your to your point, they did play two double digit seeds, but you got to win those games, and they blew both teams out. So that's a good start. And man, I, I talked about it pre tournament. A uh, star to watch out for, Jared McCain. He's been phenomenal. He lit James Madison up for a thirty piece. Absolutely athletic freak, torching the nets when he gets going. And then they got good contribution finally from Tyrese Proctor, Jeremy Roach. That backcourt needs to play well in this game because, as you mentioned, Houston is an older team full of experienced guards. I mean, you want to know how tough Houston is. They blew a lead against Texas A&M in that incredible second-round game. It goes overtime. They fouled out their four best players and still won 100-95 to in overtime. You're going to have to kill this Houston team. Yeah. To beat them. And, again, it goes back. Is Duke tough enough to stay mentally locked in? Now, I think keys for them, they're going to obviously have to hit shots, right? We talked about the backcourt. They're going to hit shots. Phil Pasky is going to have to try to get his nose in there and fight for some offensive rebounds for extra possessions. The thing about Houston, though, they are susceptible, even though they've got the best defense, their offense is good enough, they are susceptible to some cold shooting nights. And if Duke can catch fire, I don't know if Houston is capable, let's say, to come back from like 12-13 against a red-hot shooting team. With all that being said, I'm trusting Houston's toughness. They showed me a lot in round two. I think their guards went out and just physically overwhelmed Roach and Proctor and McCain and all of them. But I do think Duke's going to keep it closer than what people originally think. So I, I don't have enough time for us to go in depth on the last two down in the uh, Midwest. The one seed Purdue taking on the five seed Gonzaga, uh, 7.39 p.m. on TBS and True TV. And the two seed Tennessee taking on Crichton, the three seed. Uh, at 10 9 p.m. on Friday at TBS and True TV. I'm kind of leaning towards Gonzaga, actually. Well, no, I'm leaning towards Purdue. Purdue got past that initial hump, and it feels like they're going to be here for a bit. So I'm leaning towards Purdue uh, in that first matchup. And uh, I've got Tennessee taking on Carolina in the national championship, so i got to pick Tennessee in that bottom matchup there. Um, looking at, Just looking at the bracket before I get you out of here, the idea of these – certain matchups potentially happening has to have the NCAA just salivating because you've got potentially North Carolina versus Arizona and the elite eight in the West to go to the final four. So that, I mean, that writes itself, Carolina versus Caleb love pretty much, or you might have Carolina versus Clemson in the West, which would be odd uh, in itself. I don't think it's ever happened before. Uh, you'd have two ACC teams playing each other in the elite eight. Well, Carolina and Clemson has never happened before in the elite eight. And then over on the South, where we were just talking about, you could get either, Houston versus NC State, which would be a rematch of the 83 Valvano National Championship for the, for the Wolfpack, which would be uh, almost destiny at this point. If, if the, the Wolfpack continue this path and they go through a one seed Houston to do it, then I, there's not really a whole lot I can say <laughs> at that point. Yeah. Or they might face Duke. It might be Duke NC State in the Elite Eight, which would cause Raleigh Durham area to just crater into the ground. And I, I don't even know what would happen from there. Um, but a lot of good matchups here. Love having you on to be able to dissect these. We hope we were able to help folks put their final bets in uh, before these games start in a couple hours. But uh, go follow these guys over on Twitter slash X, whatever the kids are calling it these days, uh, for everything college basketball. Um, I believe it's EC, ECB. It's down here on the thing. It, uh, uh, ECB, ECB Podcast, ECB podcast 10. The ECB Podcast 10. Follow them over there. Uh, I imagine you, do you guys go much further past the end of the regular season in terms of new shows? Um, yeah, so we, we have a whole line of summer shows where we'll do like old school reviews where we'll sit down and pick like classic games and talk over them and dissect them. We all, we'll have coaches on. We'll, we have a whole line of summer shows, man. Season don't end for us. We got a whole line of stuff coming in the summer. Nice. So that's it for uh, for franchise players for uh, Thursday, March 28, 2024. Enjoy March Madness tonight, Friday, the rest of the weekend. Root on the ACC teams, the triangle teams that are playing. See how far they can advance. Shout out to everybody that joined us today. We'll see you next week.